Very good afternoon uh, to all of you. Um, welcome. Uh, welcome to the ACE webinar series on humanitarian diplomacy. Um, my name is Ferosa and I will be here with you to learn throughout the two-hour session. Um, but before we start the session, uh, we would appreciate if you can turn off your microphone unless you're being asked uh, or being called uh, to speak. Um, so uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, this is the third webinar series that we have conducted um, to actually provide the continuous education for our AHA Center Executive Program graduates, um, NDM officers, uh, our partners, as well other competent authority. Um, uh, this very special occasion wouldn't have been a success without the generous support from uh, the government of Japan through Japan ASEAN Integration Fund. Why this is so special for the A Center? Um, if you can see in my background here, yes, uh, this event falls in the week of the ninth anniversary of the A Center. Um, if you can see uh, in the corner, the left corner of your screen, there is a tagline on transforming through uncertainty. Uh, yes, this is represent the spirit of the Ask Center that has been transforming into a better, bigger and stronger organization in the middle of a pandemic. And hopefully um, in the future, we can tackle up the challenges together. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would call our executive director, Ibu Adriana Kamal, to officially uh, open the session and give the opening remarks. Ibu Adeni Kamal, uh, I would hand over the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ya Osa. Greetings from Jakarta, uh, Indonesia. Uh, my name is uh, Adelina Kamal. Thank you so much for joining this uh, third uh, webinar series uh, for the AHA Center Executive Program. Yesterday, AHA Center commemorated our uh, nine-year anniversary. Uh, we turned nine years old uh, yesterday. Uh, so happy birthday to all of us and thank you so much to ASEAN member states, uh, colleagues from the National Disaster Management Organization of the ASEAN countries for supporting the AHA Center as well as the partners uh, who have uh, uh, helped AHA Center over the past nine years, uh, making us grow and also uh, uh, strengthen uh, this organization uh, into uh, what it is uh, right now. And for our birthday, we have a very nice birthday present uh, in the form of the amazing well-seasoned diplomat, Ambassador uh, Laura Del Rosario. Uh, she will share her thoughts on humanitarian diplomacy uh, based on real life work experience. And to facilitate the discussion, we have uh, Dr. Miguel Dorotan from the Asian Institute of Management based in the Philippines. Thank you so much, Ambassador Laura, for joining us as well as Dr. Miguel for facilitating today's discussion. Happy to be here. I'm glad to, um, I'm glad to have uh, many of our uh, ACE program graduates here with us because this session is specially designed uh, for you. Uh, the ACE program, as you know, has been organized by AHA Center since 2014. And uh, that time, AHA Center was just two years old. Uh, it was funded, it has been funded by the government of Japan through Japan Asian Integration Fund and supported by over 20 uh, training partners. And some of these uh, partners are with us uh, today. Uh, by now, nine years old, we have organized six batches of ASEAN executive program and generated 97 graduates uh, from the 10 ASEAN member uh, states. Uh, last year uh, batch, the participants uh, were lucky, were very fortunate because we introduced a new course for the first time. And this is uh, on humanitarian diplomacy, delivered by Asian Institute of Management and featuring Ambassador uh, uh, Laura. I still remember when you came over to our office uh, last year, Ambassador. And this uh, course in line, is in line with the uh, two professional qualities that we want to uh, build into our ACE program graduates. And these are for them uh, to become a collaboration builder uh, and also to become a result-oriented leader. In addition to a course by the Asian Institute of Management, uh, last year we also had uh, a, a great lecture 
from uh, Ambassador Jo Tindall from uh, New Zealand. She used to be New Zealand's climate change negotiator and she co-chaired uh, climate change negotiations uh, and also brokered uh, uh, climate change deals. We, uh, we learned uh, from her how to be herself uh, in the midst of this uh, climate change uh, negotiation, which happened to be male dominated and uh, how to uh, uh, basically uh, unleash a certain potential in you uh, while uh, not being uh, other person but be yourself. So we, we learned uh, so much from her too. So the, the ACE program graduates last year are very fortunate and uh, we want to replicate this by having this uh, lecture from Ambassador Laura again through online. Now reflecting back on my uh, uh, journey over the past 25 years or so, if there is one thing that is the most difficult thing to do, I must say, uh, that will be on diplomacy and negotiation. And this, this is applicable both at the negotiating tables as well as on the ground in the field when I get deployed. Uh, it requires soft skills. It requires perseverance, persistence. It requires patience. Uh, and also, most importantly, the ability to read uh, the negotiating theater uh, and also understand uh, the other parties, uh, what they have in mind, their agenda, and also understand ourselves, most importantly. Um, and there are so many uh, complexities around it that uh, will require perseverance in going through this uh, negotiation, uh, the talks and uh, the diplomacy. Um, fortunately, this can be learned. Uh, and I have been uh, learning these uh, skills and I'm still learning uh, by observing how others are doing it, by uh, learning from people who have done it, like Ambassador Laura, Ambassador Joe Tindall, and also by practice, practicing it, by applying it to our day-to-day -day situation and doing it ourselves. And that's how we, we grow uh, our skills. So I hope today uh, will be a great day for all of us uh, to learn uh, and also get inspired. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you, uh, you will enjoy today's session. And thank you again, Ambassador Laura, for your time. I look forward to uh, listening uh, from you. Uh, for ACE program participants and our colleagues from AHA Center, be engaged uh, actively, ask questions. Uh, it's a very rare opportunity to have uh, 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 this uh, speaker with rich experience uh, with us, sharing her real life experience. So thank you and have a good day. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat, Adelina. That was good. Thank you for this for the introduction. Thank you very much, Ibu Adana Kamal. As Ibu Adana said, uh, participants, you can ask as many questions as you have. You may propose your question and type it in the chat box. But before that, please put your name um, and organization as well as your country. And do turn on your camera and microphone when we are calling your name and please do keep your questions short and concise. Um, well, let us now delve to the meat of this event. We are pleased uh, to have our partner here, the ASEAN Institute of Management or AIM. The AIM is based in the Philippines. Uh, AIM is an Asian pioneer in management education and globally recognized as having the world's highest standard. The Institute has sought to empower students to thrive in challenging and rapidly environments with mission to sustain the growth of ASEAN businesses and societies by developing professional and responsible leader and manager. And uh, we are so happy having Ambassador Laura de la Rosario in here to share uh, her expertise. And from who else we can learn on how to negotiate and communicating their stuff, if not from Ambassador Laura. Uh, Ambassador was the DFA Undersecretary for International Economic Relations uh, of the Republic of the Philippines from 2011 to 2016. The APEC Forum, OECD Forum, Asia Cooperation Dialogue were all within her remit. She was also in charge of bilateral economic relations and brought the mission to 
Japan, Korea, uh, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, and Iran. I hope I cover it all. Um, the ambassador was also assigned as the diplomatic minister for political affairs in the Philippine Embassy in uh, Washington, D.C. back in 1993. And currently, uh, Ambassador Laura served as President of Medium College and Distinguished Fellow in Development Management at the ASEAN Institute of Management. And here we have our charming Dr. Miguel Dorotan who will be facilitating the session. Dr. Miguel is an adjunct faculty in AIM. He's experienced in public health uh, practitioner with a history of working hum in humanitarian affairs uh, within the Philippines and overseas. Uh, he worked during Super Typhoon Yolanda back in 2019, um, Nepal earthquake, Maui crisis, um, Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh. And he obtained a master's of science in international public health from Liverpool of Tropical Medicine in the UK. And he helped doctor of medicine from the University of Santo Tomas in the Philippines. I know I've been talking a lot and now uh, let's give the floor to Dr. Miguel. Dr. Mix, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Osa, and uh, good afternoon. And thank you uh, for the introduction and kind words, uh, Adelina. Um, again, we thank the uh, ASEAN Humanitarian Center for inviting us again uh, this year to provide this lecture. And um, we're very grateful that the ambassador is still uh, free to join us today and grace us. Um, yeah, we remember that we were back, we were in Jakarta last year to provide the same course, but we delivered it across uh, three days. So the challenge now is with the ambassador to deliver it in just over an hour. So my role really here is to uh, to to uh, what to call it to moderate the ambassador to uh, to give the time check and to facilitate all your questions um, this afternoon. So I guess without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the ambassador. But prior to that, we'll we have three questions just to give a context to the ambassador as to who are in this room. So if I may launch a poll and give you a few minutes uh, or a few seconds to actually answer, um, please do so. So we basically just have three questions, right? So if you could see now. So the first question is just for us to understand where are you coming from geographically? Right. Um, the second question asks the best, uh, how would you best describe your role? in your organization. Right. And the third question is that uh, really about, just about asking if you were involved in any deep negotiation. These three questions would uh, give the ambassador a, uh, an idea how to go about with the discussion. All right. So we have, uh, okay. We'll give you a few minutes as well. So we have 20 now out of 55 people here in this room. It's exciting, no? It's like uh, waiting for the uh, results of the U.S. elections. <laughs> right. So they are. I'm ninety-seven percent. Yeah, mom, mom, are you able to see the results? Yes. Are you seeing the results? Uh, yeah, ninety-five percent are coming from ASEAN, one yeah. percent Asia Pacific, and one yeah. from Europe. Right. Okay. The one from Europe. And we have. Is, is it the orga uh, no, European organization, the European participant? Is it an organization or a national ministry? Is it the one from, uh, I think, MSF? Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's the um, Doctors Without Borders? That's right, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I, I, may, I just marked as ASEAN because I'm based here in the region. Oh, okay. Okay. So we need some from there. Okay. 
And then how best would you describe your role in the organization? <clears throat> There's no reply yet. Yeah, so we have around 15% um, uh, from the senior management, a 33% from middle management, around 31 who are technical specialists and around 21% who are rank and file. Okay, so at least and, I can adjust the lecture <laughs> at these examples, yeah. okay? And I want uh, and, 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 and the third question. I, yeah, third question. Yeah. The third question is about uh, have you been involved in a diplomatic negotiation? So we have 41% or around 16 who said yes and 59 who said no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. okay. So yeah. uh, shall we go? Thank you very much. So it's 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 um it's a mixed group, and and I'll see some portions might be uh, familiar to you already, but there are those who might find this a new one. But but let let me start with something here that I am crunching two lectures in one lecture, because uh, last year when I met Adelina for the first time, I only um, focus on humanitarian and diplomacy, but now we have to go to negotiation. So that means there are two parts to this lecture. Okay, so can we start now and then we will close the poll? So, okay, what, what are the bases? Uh, so this is the title of my lecture actually, Humanitarian Diplomacy. We have to look at humanitarian issues and negotiating techniques. The objective is to reach an agreement on humanitarian issues. Okay, first slide. I'll, I'll try to go as fast as I can. But there are two bases for humanitarian diplomacy. One, of course, the human rights law applied at all times in peace and war. And then international humanitarian law, which is applied during conflict. Now, there are two different applications of these two laws, the human rights and international humanitarian right, which we'll show in the next slide. For instance, for humanitarian uh, rights law, sometimes you can suspend some of the human rights. For instance, if there is terrorism, if you notice some countries, they suspend uh, the writ of habeas corpus. That means that you can, you can arrest anyone, and, uh, but in humanitarian ob objective, you cannot suspend the humanitarian law. So, 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 so in our case, the political rights are suspended um, during, uh, for, human, for human rights reasons and for security reasons. And I think you know that. In some countries, you have the Internal Security Act. The ISA, in a way, suspends certain, certain uh, human rights. But for both laws, the objective is to protect the life, health, and dignity of the people. Okay, next slide. Please tell me if I go too fast. Okay, I'll try to go one, one second per slide. Okay. Now, uh, there are, of course, non-allowable suspension of cer certain fundamental rights. The right to life, the prohibition of torture, the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, and the prohibition of ser servitude and slavery. So these are really very, very basic. And the right to life, it stays there, no matter what, uh, even regardless of the international security um, challenges that we have. So these are the, um, what do you call that? The core values of human rights law, prohibition of torture, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, and prohibition of servitude and slavery. Next. Now, uh, you also look at the, now, if you look at the human rights law and the humanitarian law, the humanitarian law kicks in, in times of strife and conflict. So the objective really is to protect persons who are not participants in the conflict. And of course, to restrict the means and methods of warfare, because there are some countries that use rape as a weapon, especially against women, of course, who else do they rape, the soldiers rape women. So these are, these are of course, uh, prohibited. And of course, the use of chemical and biological weapons. Uh, these are things that, you know, that the international court, of what they call that, the ICC, criminal court, will run after in case uh, there are uh, violations committed in these areas, rape and use of chemical and biological weapons. Okay, next. Um, now, what are the core principles of hum humanitarian law? And this is what we are, right? Uh, we are humanitarian assistants. We are humanitarian diplomats. Number one, of course, is 
to up, uphold the dignity of the human person and we're supposed to be impartial. And of course, we have to be neutral. We cannot take sides. So if we're taking, let's say we, we, let's say we are in country X and there are two groups that are at war with each other, two different religions, and we belong to one religion, we cannot side with any of them. In our assistance, we have to assist both. And of course, we're supposed to be independent. That means we should not be beholden to the country that we are helping and we are not beholden to any country in the organization. So, so the, uh, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Canadians, the Japanese, nobody can dictate you know, what we're supposed to do because we are supposed to be independent from any country because we are basically upholding the core principles of humanitarian law. Okay, next. Um, we also have to look at uh, the time when humanitarian diplomacy is needed. Uh, like for instance, when do we come in? When there's already a densely populated areas of needs, like, like for instance, the displaced persons, if they're already uh, getting sick because they don't, there are so many, you know, they are packed in a small area, or maybe this, the conflict is unstructured. You don't know where it's coming from. There are threats from all sides and you don't know, especially in certain countries that have many borders, you don't know where they're coming from the left side or the right side. And of course, as I said, during displacement of people, when they have to go to another place for safety. And then people, the children cannot be educated anymore. People have no access to food. And then people are getting sick and there are no doctors and they cannot go to the hospitals. There are no clinics. And again, sexual violence, because I said sometimes rape is used as a weapon of warfare. Next one. Uh, and then what are the fundamental humanitarian issues? One. These are the things that really we have to address in any humanitarian activity. You have to give access to people needing assistance. And then you have to discuss the modality of the delivery of the assistance. And then of course, we have to share the responsibility with the state because sometimes there are some people, they think that it's just the, it's just the, what do you call that, the, the, the helper uh, that's responsible like the Red Cross only. No, we have to recognize that the Red Cross also needs the government that is being assisted. And of course, transparency of distribution goes. This can be very political because for instance, uh, I know during some typhoons in the Philippines when goods are delivered and the goods are distributed to various um, evacuation sites and people complain and say, why are they receiving more? Why are they receiving different kinds of goods? Because sometimes uh, people send goods from different quality, people serve sometimes um, meat products or fish products and they say, why, they, why are they getting meat? Why are we getting fish? You know, and, and, and this, can, uh, this can cause further, uh, what they call that, disappointment in the people and it, it makes them feel a little bit w more worse than they already are if they see that there's discrimination in the way we extend assistance. Okay, next slide. I hope I'm not too fast. Okay, I'm trying to run as fast as I can because of the negotiations. Now, we also need another part of this since we know that we have to address people based on their access to food, uh, medicine, assistance, shelter, and that, and safety uh, physically. We need humanitarian space. We need to have a place where we can operate. And so we usually negotiate with the state or the warring groups because sometimes the state might not be directly involved. Maybe there are two groups in conflict with each other. And so we have to talk to them and say, can you please give us a place so that you don't attack that place, you consider us a safe space. It's, it's almost like during times of war under the Geneva Convention, nobody should attack the Red Cross. So we need that area where we can operate. And then of course, the, the problem is sometimes when you want to assist a state, not all states or not all warring groups agree to that. They, they hold back because they will say, how do we know that you will not assist our enemies? And of course, we have to tell them, we have to assist your enemies as we will assist you, you know, because we have to tell them that we are neutral. And then there are others, of course, who don't want you to assist their enemies. And so they don't want to give the consent. Or sometimes... They, they, they want, there are some people who want to be bribed, you know, you have to pay them a favor before they can give you a consent. So this, these are things that you have to weigh, at least with your group. Like, uh, 
how, how do you negotiate with this person? Because there's some people really that are so corrupt that you really have to give them certain goods, all right? And then, but at the same time, time is running out. So do you give in or at the same time, do you also hold back? And then at the same time, how do you manage it so that at least your, your assistance is quick enough? Because otherwise the conflict grows bigger or the people are dying, they grow in number, okay? Next slide, please. Um, we also have to, this one, the capricious and arbitrary withholding of consent is really, it happens some many times in, in certain conflict areas because, because they don't trust you and they don't trust the other side. So it's really eventually later on, you have to get their trust and say that you are there really as a neutral person who is willing to help not only them, but the others. You have to, you have to emphasize, of course, that you are there also to help them and not, and not just you know side, uh, help the other. And then of course you have to point out to the fact that people are starving and then when starvation comes in, especially if their people are starving, it will affect their own future development. So they have to look at the short term and the long term um, effects of what they're doing. And then of course, if we already destroy the people's physical integrity, meaning they are being tortured or they are uh, being manipulated or assaulted or raped, or in other words, they, they are not being treated anymore with dignity. And so this, we have to look at the level of starvation and the physical integrity, whether it's overly, you know, being abused, okay? And then next one, next slide. Now, the, the question is, when should you initiate humanitarian intervention in situation during warfare? Because sometimes we are in ASEAN. Let us say there's a 12th member of ASEAN so that we don't have to pinpoint to anybody. Let's say this 12th member is undergoing, let's say, uh, a warfare uh, of some kind similar to, to Syria. And you know, in Syria, there are two religious groups involved. And at the same time, if you look at what happened in Syria, it was initiated by climate change. Some people do not know that. You see, in Syria, there's this minority group that belong to a different um, sect of the Muslim religion who did not belong to the ruling administration. They had been experiencing a series of drought years. So water, they had no rains, there's no water, their animals are dying, their people are dying, their, their crops are dying. And so they, they had to move to another place. They had to move, I think, south, southward. Unfortunately, where they moved were the groups that belonged to another sect of that religion. So there was a conflict because they said, why are you coming to our place? This is our place, you do not belong here. And so conflict arose. And of course, um, when that came in, the government of course stepped in, the government of Syria, and they tried of course to, to protect one group versus another. Now, here you are, you belong to a United Nations group or you like, assuming that this country is part of ASEAN 12, assuming there are 12 of us, when will you come in and say, we have to intervene. ASEAN 12 should come in and help in, uh, in this political uh, situation, which is started during, which was started by a natural disaster. Or what if it's happening during a, nation, a natural disaster? That means you have two things happening here. There is a civil war, or there is a, what they call tribal war. And at the same time, there's typhoon, there's flooding. So definitely, the dangers are doubled. And that means that the threats to the lives of these people are doubled, starvation is doubled. And of course, the physical integrity of the people the uh, is also uh, more intensified. Okay, next. Um, the next slide, please. Now, so I talked about uh, what they call that. I talked about the trigger mechanism. So when, when you're already there, the regional group will have to decide when to come in, how to come in, and at what level to come in. So assuming ASEAN 12, the secretary said, okay, we will send, um, you know, people who can negotiate with the 12 member of ASEAN so that all of us can come in and help the people who are suffering, the two groups that are at war with each other, who are also facing the same 
uh, lack of food, lack of medicine. Of course, the children cannot go to school. So the best thing that you can do, of course, is you choose the people who should go there. They should be people who have knowledge of the people who are in, a, in the administration of that country that is in conflict. Because let us face it, in ASEAN 10, we must know somebody in the other countries of ASEAN. So in other words, we have official contacts. So those of you who are in defense know people who are in the defense ministries of other ASEAN. And therefore, if you are in the humanitarian section or sector of your government, you should know all the members in this hypothetical case in that ASEAN member number 12. And then of course, you must have some idea of these people and what their interests are and how they got to be where they are and their family. Because sometimes when you discuss, you don't carry, you, you have to look beyond the rank or beyond the titles. Of, although, of course, that's very important. You have to give due respect to that person. And then you say, oh, okay, let's say your excellency or, um, or your honor or whatever address you use to address that person. And, and then you have to find out more or less how they are. Are they on the very, very rigid side? Or are they very soft, meaning they're easily persuaded? Or are they people, or is one of them eager to be promoted? So you have to look at what their ambitions are because this is how they will negotiate. Those who want to be promoted, of course, they want to show off. And they want to show that they're in control. And they want to show that they're the only ones who can make decisions. And, and of course, this will make it harder for you to negotiate if a person negotiating also has a personal agenda, okay? So can we go to the next one? And at the same time also, you have to get to know the country's basic ideology and political interests. There are some, there are some countries, of course, that have different uh, leanings towards certain, certain countries. Like there are some of us perhaps who are closer to the United States or closer to Japan or closer to Australia or on the opposite, there are those who don't care about the US, who don't care about Australia or who don't care about Japan. And then of course they might see you. If let's say I'm from the Philippines, people might say, oh, she's pro-American. Oh, she's, you know, uh, she's negotiating for the Americans. You know, you have to look at this also because they might also be judging you from what they think you are representing. And then at the same time, because of the war, you must know also why are they there in that conflict? And eventually the main question that you ask is what is, what is it that you are most interested in? If you can get the answer to this question. Um, there are some people like, I'll give an example, let's say during the typhoon Yolanda. There were a lot of people who tried to help. There are some politicians who wanted to grandstand before the public. They want to show that they are the Superman of that particular situation. But there are others who think that the, these politicians are just impeding you know, the assistance. And then at the same time, the poor volunteers, they just want to help. But at the same time, if, if you just want to help, Perhaps in, in some instances that there are too many volunteers and it becomes messy because people are helping from different sides. And I think that's what happened during the, the biggest typhoon in Yolanda. There were so many volunteers. Some people said it was almost so hard to organize everybody because each one had a different agenda. The, their agenda is agenda of their organization. So um, maybe there are those who are just focus on children, there are those who are just focus on the women, there are those who are just focus on food or on shelter or on medicine. So somebody should be there who should be able to orchestrate all of this to act as a conductor, okay? And then of course you have to know the country's economic interest. To me, this is always very, very important because if they know that somehow the way they're positioning themselves in this war could affect their own economic development, or could affect donor donation, then perhaps they might be able to modify their hardened position, okay? Next slide. So this is what you do as you prepare for negotiations. You should have all of this um, in, the, in the background. 
so the best way for me every time we negotiate is um, we go low, we go low, meaning we don't strut around and we tell them, okay, I am an ambassador, I'm undersecretary, deputy minister, and so on. What, what we do is that we try to introduce ourselves as persons, you know, as friends. And we, I often tell people what I am, what I do, and what I'm interested in. And, and they see the human side of me. And at the same time, I don't lose my sense of humor. Of course, the situation is bleak and very sad. But if you can maintain some kind of likeness in your conversation, and then you can make uh, you know, appropriate jokes so that you break, you break the unease in the in, in in the group. And of course, it helps if you are a little bit warmer, friendlier, even if somebody is uh, even if they're very rigid looking and very unapproachable looking. So, so the warmer you are, the more approachable you are, the, the better it is. And then as you build trust, find out which representative in the group has the same objective as your group. Because even if they just belong to one group, you'll find out that somebody is more willing to compromise, to reach out, well, there are others who will say it's, it's either my way or the highway. You will find this out. Now, how, how do you find this? You cannot get it during the first sitting and definitely you cannot get it even during the first three days. Negotiations usually take more than a day and um, you're lucky if you can get a quick uh, reply within three days. But within those three days, as you share meals and as you share discussions, and as you let them tell you what is happening around them, because they'll tell you their points of view, the point of view of the government, if they belong to the government, and the point of view of the other side, if they belong to the other side. And, and if they're warring groups, you will find out what, is, what each side is trying to protect or trying to push for. And ultimately, you will be able to find out that there's a common ground between the two of them. Almost always, both of them want equality, fairness. They want a fair um, settlement in whatever they're fighting for. If they're fighting for a piece of territory, you know that each one wants to make sure that one doesn't get more than the other. Each one, of course, especially the warring group, they all want to come to go home. I don't think anybody wants to prolong the conflict. And I think all of them also are worried about the family. So the personal side will come in. And of course, if you point to that family aspect of what they're doing, and if you mention that the faster we resolve the conflict or the better we are able to help the people, the better it is for everybody. And then of course you appeal to their sense of humanity when you speak about the children because they also have children. Okay, next slide, please. Um, preparing for negotiations and then and then you also but you know that one is during the, the negotiation itself but this one should have been ahead I'm sorry I I um, put my slide in the wrong order before you even go to that country you have to read read and read so you have to get background briefings if necessary from the intelligence com community you, you get it from the military, you get it from the political scientists, you get it from the secretariat and find out how the conflict came up and how is it being resolved and what are the subgroups that are happening, if there are subgroups that are dividing, if there are people that are breaking apart from the main group. And then of course, as I said, get to know the points of contention, which I covered in my previous slide. And then, of course, the most important one is getting to know the interests of each delegation. And then as soon as you know what they are, you have to get to know the neutral positions. Now, how do you do this? They have what they call the objectivity, the objective participant. What some negotiators, especially those who, who study under the Harvard School of Negotiation, they call it, you go to the balcony. 
you go to the balcony or the veranda or you know a, a, a place where you can look down it's because when you go up at a higher place and then you look down you more or less see the landscape below and you more or less see where everybody is so that if you have to make a landscape drawing of where, where the people are, you should be able to draw and say, these people belongs to this group, this one is neither here nor there. And then later on you will see, uh, and you, then you will see where the common interests are. And at the same time, you will also be able to share with them and say, uh, you, uh, as, as, my, as Migs will say, it's, it's really dancing with the, with the hurricane, okay? And then you share what your positions are and you share your concerns as part of building trust. So, so you can also tell them, like, like in my case, I always appeal to the children's future. So I would tell them, you know, the longer you keep the children starving, the more their brains will be affected. And as these children become adults, they will become a burden to the community. So starving children will not become productive adults. And the more we can reach them, the better it is for your community. And it's also better for the other community. Because, you know, if, if the women and the children are the one most affected, and if you appeal to them that these are actually the main concerns of each society. If the women and the children are compromised in their integrity physically, in their health, and in their mental health, emotional health, then it will be very hard to build a nation. And so you start from there. And of course, since you are a humanitarian group, you are not part of the political negotiations to decide what should go to what. They should see that. You are not taking a political position in the, in the warfare. You are just taking a position in what you think should be done, okay? So that at least you can do something that will really prevent not just the situation from getting worse, but, you know, harvesting the bad effects of the current situation, especially when consent is being delayed for you to come in. Okay, next next step. And then of course, taking positions is not similar to getting an objective. Positions are detrimental to reaching an objective. Meaning, let's say our objective is to reach point A. That's our objective. But let's say one person wants to go to point A by using a cart. Another person wants to use a car. You see, the positions are different, but your objectives are the same. Find out what are the common objectives for everybody and what are the different means that each one wants to use to reach that objective. Because this is where you will have to have a creative process. Like, like um, th there are times of, of course, there's some people who will say, no, no, why don't we just compromise? You add the two divided by two and you know what, what, or split the difference. It doesn't work because sometimes you cannot really split the difference. You really have to work it out so that the solution is, is workable because sometimes the solution might entail more forces or might entail more logistics or it might entail more danger. And, and, and then you have to look at it from different points of view. And then next one. In, in um, next slide, please. Okay. And then of course, um, they also have to understand why you are fighting for certain principles. So as I said, if it's a humanitarian objective for me, I always look at the child and the women because I am looking at the human dignity principle because they are the ones that are most vulnerable. But at the same time, if the other side is promoting more the safety of the men because they want to preserve their warriors, 
they want to preserve people who will prolong the warfare. So we have to look at how do we balance this? Once we want to help the women as soon as possible and the children and this group say, no, 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 no. We want you to help our men first. Okay. So this is where you will have perhaps to do uh, what kind of assistance will you go so that at least you will satisfy both. Maybe you can say, okay, we'll have three groups. One group will take care of the men, one group will take care of the women, one group will take care of the children. But remember, you also have to look at your logistics. And remember, you are not just assisting one side. In every humanitarian assistance conflict, there are always two sides. You have to assist both. And then, of course, you have to look, okay, the head of the negotiating team of one side, perhaps, might be more uh, attuned to your objective. So try to get that consent first. Because as soon as one side consents, it's easier to get the consent of the other because they want to appear magnanimous. And of course, when both sides are trying to harden their positions, then it really becomes harder. And, and that is when you really have to look at their common interests. And then you have to look, are there, are, are there national interests in both that, that you can put together, together with the humanitarian group? And that is the hardest part of it, as I said, without compromising too much so that it looks too diluted or it doesn't look like it's a, it's a good objective or it's a good position. And this is where you will need something. Okay, this is where I will use the next technique. I hope it's in the next slide. I don't know how it goes. Next slide, please. Okay, Th this is what I mean. When you're having a difficult time and both sides are being adamant, being stubborn, Usually in, in my experience, this is based on my experience, I suggest a negotiating group at the lowest level possible. And then the, you might ask why? Because the lowest level are not as strict as the ones who are at the top. Because the ones at the top have to protect their position, they have to protect their reputation, they have to protect you know, their leadership position. But the ones at the lowest level, they are the most relaxed and sometimes they're the ones that are most friendly with one another. If you just have to look at the participants in, in, in some seminars, isn't it those who belong to the same level, the lower level, are usually more at ease and they're the ones who are having more fun? And so you start there because they can somehow be more open to one another. And then later on, this lower group can report to the medium group. And then the medium level will be able to say, okay, we approve of this. We, okay, we don't approve of that. And in that sense, you save the face of the senior officials because it's still at the, at the medium level. So the medium level will still send the working group level at the bottom. Okay, you go back and tell them, we, we find some value in this proposal. And so you work at that level from the lower level to the medium level. When things are starting to formalize and you can see that you are breaking through, then you will go to the higher group, the ad hoc working group, and then later on to the senior officials. That's, that's why when, whenever uh, people report to me, assuming I'm not directly involved in negotiations, I always ask them, has that been vetted at the lowest level? Did it go up the ranks? Because sometimes, of course, if you know that it has gone through the ranks, there is also some kind of ownership. And at the same time, if it has been approved by level, then at least you are very comfortable in the knowledge that somehow it will be approved also at the higher level because nobody will lose face anymore because all the adjustments have been done at the lower and at the medium level. Okay. So agreements at the ad hoc working group, this is the medium level, will then be elevated at the senior officials level, moving from one strong position to a common interest position, which was arrived at because of the lowest level at the working group, because they don't have to save any face. You see, they're, they're, they're at the lower level. They know they can get turned down. They wouldn't mind because they said, anyway, I'm just a lower ranking subordinate. So what if nobody approves my proposal? 
But then, of course, you have to guide this lower level too so that they don't propose stupid ideas, right? But at the same time, if it gets rejected, you don't, you as the senior official, you don't get uh, offended because it was rejected at the lowest level. And the one who is taking it is, of course, the lowest level in your delegation. So it's really no honor harm, okay? No face damage or no, there's no red face anywhere. Okay, next level, please. I mean, next slide. And then, of course, remember that when we harden one's position, it is not considered cool in a multilateral position. I'm talking about multilateralism here because I'm talking about ASEAN, for instance. But if you're talking only with one country, somehow, um, uh, we, we it, it, since you have, hopefully you have developed some kind of rapport or support for one another, um, perhaps this hardening will not be there anymore. And of course, being too nice is not a good strategy either because people will doubt your sincerity. They say, oh, oh is he being so nice? Is he trying to, you know, to flatter me or is he trying to fool me? So do not be too nice because you will also be suspected of having, a, you know, another agenda which is true you all of us have hidden agendas but we don't have to pretend to be very very nice and then later on propose something that we will manipulate the other and then of course we always ask in every negotiation for at least three positions the position of one side the position of the other side assuming when there are two sides negotiating and then the position the third position we call this the negotiated agreement, meaning it's what is called, it could be the compromise. But if there are three sides negotiating, the two sides that are at war, and you are the humanitarian agency. So there are three positions. So you should have a fourth position. That fourth position is almost like the, um, the possible uh, negotiated agreement, okay? Um, it, it's almost like the, the components of all the common elements are there. So if one agrees, okay, we agree that the humanitarian assistance be given to children first, let's say that's a co one common agreement. Or some people might say, we only want you to distribute your goods in this area. We don't want you to go in that area. Okay, so you look at this or another one would say, we don't want people from the foreign affairs or from the defense ministry to be in the distribution of goods. We only want humanitarian workers. Or they might say, we don't want anybody who comes from another government outside the organization. So they might say, we will accept your humanitarian assistance provided that all those who are helping are members of ASEAN 12. As I said, I'm talking about a hypothetical ASEAN 12. So they said, we don't want somebody from Japan. We don't want anybody from Australia. Or somebody might say, we don't want anybody from this particular country. Okay? So you have to consider that. And sometimes some countries, they will consider somebody from a particular country. I hope our Myanmar... Uh, the representatives are aware of this. When there was a flooding in Myanmar in the year, well, I'm trying to remember, was it 2007, 2008? They requested for the special participation of the Philippines. And we could not understand why. They chose us. They said, we want the Philippines to lead the delegation. Maybe it's because we are the farthest from everybody. You know us, isn't it? We are not all of people in ASEAN, they're either Muslims or Buddhists. We are the only Christian in ASEAN, okay? We are the only one that are, that are somehow more Western than the others. In fact, of all the ASEAN countries, the Philippines is the least ASEAN of all. So that whenever there are difficulties among the ASEAN group, they say, oh, the Philippines is... It's not siding with anybody, it's neutral because it's neither here nor there, okay? So we, we played our role there. So eventually the assistance was able to come in because at that time Myanmar did not want 
foreign governments outside ASEAN to come in. And they suspect that, that these other foreign governments might enter through the other members of ASEAN. I'm not very sure about these facts, okay? So don't quote me here. But what I'm just saying is that they just wanted an ASEAN-focused aid without non-ASEAN members, and they want the Philippines to lead that particular uh, assistance in this particular instance, okay? So they, they may do that. And of course, both sides will have to agree. And of course, if you want somebody else, aside from ASEAN, you might say, okay, we want somebody who's outside ASEAN. And usually when there are conflicts, people go to, Nor to Norway because Norway is considered a neutral country. They are, a, they are a country of negotiators because remember Norway was never a colonial power so that at least we don't associate Norway with any colonialism, so to speak, okay? So the variety of options is there. You will discuss everything, you know, including the modality. We want only the goods to come in through airplanes, through helicopters, no cars, because, or no trucks, because they don't want the trucks to come in from one side of the country to the other. They want to protect maybe certain people from seeing other sides of the country. Okay, so if they only want helicopter airdrops, then do that, and then you try to work it out, okay? Next side. Next slide, please. And then, of course, whenever you prepare options, you reframe the problem. Um, how can I, I give an example? L like, for instance, um, this is on something else. This is economic. Uh, one time we were trying to negotiate the services framework, the services, how we can help people improve trade in services. And there was one country that did not want services because then we realized why. Because they have very few skilled workers in the services that we were trying to promote, like telecommunications, financial instruments, and so, and so on. So what we did was we reframed the problem and then we said, can we promote services? Please name the areas that you want to promote in the field of services. Then it opened everybody. And we noticed that nobody mentioned financial, nobody mentioned telecommunications. And they said, oh, we need more investments and assistance in logistics or in, or in tourism or in um, medical services. So, so you see, we, we reframe the problem instead of us pushing a particular agenda, we open it and say, how do you want it done? And then of course, reframing the problem will lead to another option. So in that case, when they decided that they will enumerate the services that they want to, to offer as negotiating points, we had to change our agreement because then we had to go into the levels of services based on the skills needed. And then later on, we had to work on the skills development of the people so that later on, everybody can participate in all the kinds of services that we all want to participate in. And so in other words, we focus on the interest so that if there is a negotiator whose presence you cannot stand because he's so, rude or because he he doesn't respect anybody or he's too pushy just let him be just focus on the interest so that at least you do not get too riled up or too affected by you know by the other uh by the personality so again as you focus on the interest don't also focus on the problem because people will say oh but we don't have this and we don't have that but then you can say, look, we will find a solution to your problem. Let us focus on what you want first. So if the people say, we want to improve teaching services, for instance, they say that's a common thing. And then everybody is saying, but you see, how can we promote teaching? We don't have so many teachers. But if you say focus on the services and they say we want to focus on teaching, then later on, you can reframe the problem and then you can reframe the solution. So you can say, can we start now with, you know, training teachers? Can we work on recognition of degrees? Can we work on 
transnational education? Can we work on teachers exchanges and so on? So you also separate the people from the problem because there are some people who create the problem because they don't want to lose their functions. Because sometimes in a negotiation, you find out at when you reach a negotiating position, there are some people who are not needed anymore. So you have to worry about that ego also, that somehow that person will have a role as we move forward, okay? And um, understand the persons involved in the negotiation. As I said, are they trying to get themselves promoted or are they trying to, pro to protect their position? So then you have to think of, how can I move this person so that he knows he still has a role to play? So maybe you can work on an ad interim solution so that that person can work on something while we are waiting for the process to move faster onward, okay? Next, uh, the next slide. Uh, next, am I at the end? Okay, so is it the end already? No, not yet. And then of course, as you discuss the various options, and then as you let the favored option to be modified. And then as soon as the modified option will become the final common position, then you will reach what they call a BATNA. You know what is a BATNA? A BATNA is the best alternative negotiated solution or agreement. In this case, it's called bat, bat, BATNESS, okay? It's the best alternative negotiated solution. That means all the principles that you discovered are common or th that everybody agreed to. Sometimes we go through a negative listing. A negative listing means you list everything. Which of these do you not object to? The ones that you do not object to, we will keep them. Those that you object to, we will remove them. That's one way. Or you can go on a positive list. Which of these do you like and which one of these do you not like? So you can use the negative list or you can use the positive list, but you always work somehow with, with what we call the various options and the various um, ingredients in a solution. And then of course, the modified option should assimilate or interest. Now, if you are a negotiator, do not expect 100% of your interest to be included in the best alternative negotiated solution. Don't expect that. Be happy if you get 70%. Because ultimately, if you get even just 60%, you can move forward. Then later on, as the problem is minimized, you will grow also in the achievement of your own objective. So work on that and then do not, as they said that in every agreement, there are certain things that you lose, but there are certain things that you gain. Just make sure that what you gain is what is most important to you. So you should also prioritize what your positions are, which positions are negotiable, which are not negotiable. So you tell that to the other side. So you might say option number two is non-negotiable for me, but option number one, three and four are negotiable. So that at least people will know where you are. And then you might say also option number one, it's partly negotiable. We can go this far. You can tell them the minimum floor. We call, I call it the floor. What is the lowest you can go? when it comes to negotiability. Meaning, are you willing to go lower? How much lower? And then later on, you cannot go any lower because once you go lower, it becomes non-negotiable. But there are others that are really non-negotiable from the beginning. And so you, you start to work around the non-negotiable positions and work with the negotiable positions. And then pretty soon, as soon as people gain their trust in you, as you move forward because your position, uh, you are, they see that you are really eager to reach a common objective and that you are being neutral, pretty soon the non-negotiable position will become negotiable as well, okay? So I think this is the end. 
uh, mix is this it okay yes sir that's your okay. last slide okay thank you very much so if you have questions please ask them now and then uh mix will help me dr darotan will help me yes ma'am uh great uh just in time 56 minutes now okay <laughs> all right as i said my role here is to keep it in yeah. time and also yeah. to uh indicate yeah. the uh the conversations mm -hmm. throughout otherwise um, it take three hours okay so. right uh, i'm very glad ma'am actually every time you you listen to the ambassador the context of the um, the stories uh, also changes, and that's why the very outset we asked you to identify yourself in your ranks. No? Um, all right, let's let's start the conversation and discussion. Open, so we'll have it for the next thirty minutes. Okay. We have received two questions already, ma'am. Um, yes, from Grace. I, I, well, I prepared two questions actually, yeah. and I. I it, it's also my part of my role to actually put the yeah. ambassador always yeah. on the spotlight. <laughs> but um, one of my questions is already related to uh, Miss Grace and Dina's uh, question mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. So you ended your presentation or your discussion, ma'am, on negotiations and negotiated yeah. agreements. And one of the questions actually here of Grace and Dina is about the room of flexibility in applying humanitarian principles. So is it a negotiable principle? Okay. Or remember, a non negotiable. Remember, non interference is only applicable to political positions. The ASEAN principle of non interference, that's political. When it's humanitarian, we have to interfere somehow because of the principle of the dignity of the person. Remember, we have to preserve the integrity of the, the physical integrity of the person. We, that is precisely why we have to negotiate. That's precisely why we have to do humanitarian diplomacy, because we have to interfere, okay? But we don't interfere in the reasons for the war or the reasons for the conflict. We have nothing to do with that. We are just there to save lives and to, of course, to ameliorate or to improve the, the conditions of the people who are, remember, humanitarian is actually helping people who are not involved in the conflict. So in effect, we are not interfering in the political, we are not aiding the, 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 the soldiers, we are aiding the, um, the refugees or, the, receive, or the, the civilians who have been displaced, okay? So that's one. And then consensus building. When we go there as ASEAN, we have to have a, a common position because we cannot help a, a third country, so to speak, if we ourselves do not agree with one another. So it goes without saying that we cannot go if we ourselves are not united. But then once we are united in what we want to do, you see, you also have to figure out how much assistance are you willing to give? There are definitely the medical assistance is always number one and the food. So it's medicine and food. These to me are non-negotiable when you have to think about humanitarian assistance and it, when, it comes to, when it comes to humanitarian diplomacy. And it's also there, isn't it? The, the principles, the access to medicine, you know, the access to food, and then the physical safety of the people, and then the access from from chemical weapons, biological weapons, and sex, sexual assault, okay? Uh, so number two, uh, no, there is no flexibility. You cannot say, I will only save the children and not the women. The principles are very, very sure. They are humanitarian, they are not human rights. If it's human rights, we don't get involved in human rights. So, so let's say, there are cases of torture in the country that we are assisting. We don't talk to the government to tell them to stop the torture. That's not ours to get involved in, okay? And that's not the, of course that's humanitarian, but it's also human rights. Remember in the human rights, uh, when they said there are certain principles of human rights that will be, ref that should be uh, respected. One of them is, prohibition of slavery and all that, and of course, prohibition of torture, okay? 
Now that one, it will be a different set of negotiators who will negotiate with the government to stop the torture or, or who will negotiate with one group in a conflict to stop the torture. To us, it, we, we are just there to deliver relief so that at least we will be saving lives. Okay, that, does that make sense? Okay, uh, do you have another question? So, um, um, right before I call on to the next question, the person will ask next. Um, Edina, do you have a follow-up question? I, Grace, do you have a follow-up question on that one? Is that clear with, from your end? It's... Uh, uh... Oh, what else is not clear? Because you might be fusing the humanitarian with the human rights. And humanitarian is not political. That's why it's called humanitarian. Human rights usually are political rights. Grace, uh, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, that is right. okay. Um, and clear, it's just, um, perhaps it's also based on our experience with the AHA Center. Yes, we are humanitarian organizations, but at the same time, we are also, um, uh, what do you call this? The tool of the uh, member state as well. So that's why yeah. I, I am yeah. keen to, <laughs> to yeah. seek a, a, a yeah. perspective yeah. from you. But yeah. that's clear, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. because you remember, when you are in a humanitarian situation, you cannot be the tool of any state, okay? But that's prohibited. That's why it says neutrality, especially if you belong to the UN or to an organization. Uh, and that's why, um, to, to me, uh, this is a course that Mix and I are trying to introduce in the school where I am president of. You know, it's a degree program in humanitarian diplomacy. So that people will understand that when you're doing political and economic diplomacy, you are a tool of the state. You're a tool of your government. When it comes to humanitarian, you are not a tool of anybody. You are a tool of mankind, of the universal mankind, you see, uh, because you're talking of the dignity of the person. Okay, uh, next question. Okay. Right. right. The next question now, uh, may we call on uh, Arnel Kapili, Deputy Director of the AHA Center. Arnel? Uh, Hi, how are you? We see. have met, isn't it, last year? Yes. But yeah. How are you? Okay. Um, maraming salamat po, Ambassador, for very practical um, tips on negotiation. Very helpful, particularly in some of the issues that we face at the A Center. Now, my, my question, Ambassador, if I, if I may, um, how would we approach um, hum humanitarian diplomacy if, if the state is a belligerent, if the state is part of the conflict itself? Um, how yeah. to negotiate and, and approach diplomacy then? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. And again, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Because um, sometimes the state is the other side of the conflict, right? Yeah. Uh, it's easier if there are two sides and one of them is not government. But when the government is always part of it, that is harder. So, so that is where really, where you have to find out the basic interest of the government. Because we have to look at it from one point of view. Usually, I may be wrong in generalizing this, usually they say it's the autocratic leaders who usually get into wars because they say liberal democracies usually do not get into war, okay? That's a common belief in political and economic affairs. And my training is makes knows this. I'm more of a political economic diplomat. Okay, so you cannot see liberal democracies at war with one another. It's usually the autocratic or people who want a strong one rule. You, you just have to look at uh, the, the governments around the world. Which are the governments that are usually involved in a conflict? Okay, don't quote me, <laughs> okay, but you're hearing me. Russia, isn't it? It's an autocratic. There's one particular Muslim country. I won't mention it because some of you are Muslims, but there is one. Or there are two. They belong to the two sides of Islam. They're, they are always involved in conflict and their leaders are both autocratic. Yeah. 
and one in fact, and, and sometimes they use religion. The autocratic regimes, they use religion. Look, you look at Russia, before Putin came, the Orthodox religion was nowhere. But then he said, okay, I will build a stronger Russia. So he said, Orthodox Russian religion is the official religion. So they are now using religion to unify the people. And, and so when it's like this, you will see uh, that these people really have an agenda, meaning a strong man's agenda. And then you will have to see where they are leading their countries to, their particular country. And then you try to figure out, is this an autocratic leader who is afraid to lose his position, okay? And, and I think the more insecure the person is, the harder it is, especially if there's a third country assisting that autocratic leader or that autocratic administration. This is the reason why the war in Syria can never be solved because Assad doesn't wanna live. And there is a country that wants to help Assad. So in that sense, the only thing that you can do is really try to work on the people who deal with people directly because these are the people who will be worrying about the well-being of their people. So, so do not go at the highest level. Parang my advice, go to the lowest Lord. level. Ah, so, yeah. Punta kayo sa barangay. You know, we go to the village chief. Don't your people need help? And I'm sure they know them personally, right? Oh, yeah, I know I have a family of 10. Or we have 20 families here and 15 families are starving. You will get your consent there. And eventually, you they will help you move up the decision-making process so that perhaps you can do some kind of assistance in a small area. Of course, you cannot cover as much as you want to, but then you do it step by step. So if I can cover village number one and village number two can see that the people there are starting to, you know, to, to be better, perhaps they say, okay, we'll do it with you. You know, um, start small, start low and then um and i think it is these people who will protect you anyway because they are protecting themselves also from the eye of the villagers <laughs> they also have to if, if i were the head of the village i will also not only will my sense of, of compassion be touched but i think because i know them i will also be with you in that sense if you want to help if you want to help us is that practical enough Yes, Mba, thank you very much. Very helpful. Yeah, okay. I don't know if this will ever happen in ASEAN. Hindi naman. I, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> so you tell me if it does, okay? So that I can talk about it in my next lecture. We'll, we'll ask Kaha Center to document it. Say <laughs> <laughs> it in the column. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, but, so we have uh, coming in some more questions coming in already, but I think before I ask the question of Madhyatri, um, I'll ask Deepo's question, which is similar or what we call it um, linked to actually Arnel's question, right? So Deepo asks, how do you see the future of ASEAN in terms of adherence to humanitarian principle or in terms of humanitarian intervention, whether that will be the ASEAN mechanism? So... Um, I, mm. I, I haven't seen any, okay, my, my, um, as long as you don't get involved in the political aspect of it, because sometimes ASEAN gets involved in the political eh, when it should be separated from the humanitarian. That's why I started my lecture with, there's an international human rights law and there's an international humanitarian law. Don't put the two together. And the international humanitarian law is followed in times of conflict, okay? And it doesn't work during times of peace. You don't need it. But the international human rights law, it's applied during both war and peace because of the security of the state, what the leaders perceive to be the security of the state. So 
provided you not you do not get involved in the political aspects okay if if the war is religion remember religion is also political because leaders use religion in fact as a weapon of division you just have to look at the united states look at trump trying to divide people according to color according to creed you know uh sometimes they they call attention to like like the evangelists versus the liberals you know uh they they have two groups so so religion can be a weapon of the state so stay away from it especially those of you who might belong to one 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 side of the religion you are there to help the person as a person so whether he's a buddhist a confucian a muslim a christian a hindu or even a zoroastrian you are there to help that person so so that i think when you help you should not also ask to me when i help people i don't know what the protocol is in asian i don't ask people what is your religion because they might think you are doing a a data analysis yeah and 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 also one time there was a a, a problem in in one part of the philippines um we we did not ask people whether they were filipinos or not because for all we know because you know how it is in in that part of the world the malaysians and the indonesians and the filipinos they travel across one another's islands you know that right in the sulu archipelago so there was a need so when our people went there they just treated everybody they did not say are you a malaysian are you indonesian are you filipino they just help everybody i mean that was the rule so so that people saw that that the humanitarian assistance was was really really sincere okay and then we didn't ask for any identification either <laughs> so they said uh i think they 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 were talking about it mom what do we do they don't have identification cards they don't have national id so we said it doesn't matter you are there really to help evacuate them from something from a conflict so but they said what if we evacuate them to the wrong island okay just help them you know because they say what if we are evacuating an indonesian to the philippines and a filipino to indonesia so he said just uh, to me um the 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 person being helped will help you decide anyway if he says i'm an indonesian you i want to be brought back to my island or if he says i am a malaysian i want to be brought to my island then you can um segregate but if they're not saying anything maybe they're also trying to look for a safe space remember the key word here is safe space humanitarian law is about safe spaces you create a safe space so that people can heal they can be nourished they can also have access to to any kind of support they can be with their family so politics has nothing to do with safe spaces for as long as you have that principle of a non political safe space you yourself are safe in your own space okay right thank you amba uh, deepo do you have a follow up question to that Yeah, thank you Ambassador for the for the answer but I just want to clarify my question is related to the future of ASEAN because you know as far as I know ASEAN is not well known in terms of you know upholding the humanitarian even the humanitarian principles you, even if you say it's not political sometimes there are you know there are cases where government actually the one uh perpetuating the humanitarian abuse or or a uh, humanitarian sovereign so if a regional organization like asean who is always you know the the non intervention principle is sacred in asean how do you see the future in asean in terms of you know actually encouraging government to pay attention to humanitarian abuses uh, upholding humanitarian principle and how oh, okay that that is okay that is not part of the aha uh -huh. you, you understand me it is not part of the aha work the way i see it i'm not doing aha but assuming i can understand your concern let us say that you are concerned again with 
ASEAN country number 12, the 12th ASEAN country, that there are human rights violations there. And then you want to interfere or to intervene, not interfere. Remember intervention, interference is not allowed, but intervention is allowed. Meaning to intervene means you have to stop the suffering. Let us say that the suffering is due to human rights violations. Is that what you're trying to say? Okay, let's say that the government is using rape as a weapon of war and you want to stop that because you cannot do your humanitarian assistance only and not be concerned with the, with the use of rape as a weapon. Okay, that means that AHA will focus on the humanitarian assistance, getting the medicine, getting the food, getting the safe space. Then you have to give that function of the political intervention to another group. Usually, if you bring it to the right uh, ministry, like uh, the ASEAN, they will use their own mechanism. Perhaps, do, do, there is an ASEAN Human Rights Committee, is it? Yeah. If there is a case, then the ASEAN Human Rights Committee should take it up. So that means your humanitarian assistance should not be subjected or controlled or be premised on the absence of, uh, of abuses. So whether there are abuses or not, you help. And then let another group take care of it. Because otherwise, you can also... Otherwise, you will be ejected from humanitarian assistance. The, 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 the state will ask you to leave. And you cannot afford to do that. So just, I call it, shut up. Okay? And then just help. And then, of course, you might be very, very angry. Then later on, you can write about it. You, are, you write your Minister of Foreign Affairs and say, these abuses are unbearable. Okay? And, and push for that and, the, and hopefully the foreign minister of other countries will band themselves together and they will say, all right, we have to do something about this. And then that will be done at another level, but that is another negotiation. And to me, that's the harder negotiation to do. Humanitarian for me is easier than political. That's why the question of our executive director, Bayan, yeah, Mr. Kapili. Yes. Uh, Arnel, uh, Deputy Director. De Deputy Director. You, his question really uh, is hard if AHA gets involved. You, you get people away from the political aspect and just focus on creating a safe space. To me, human humanitarian diplomacy is creating safe spaces. That is what it's all about. Okay, Ma'am, I think we're, we're triggering a lot of uh, discussions here, no? Um, but uh, before, we'll, we'll call on the Executive Director, Adelina, in a few, uh, with her question to ask it personally. But we would okay. like to recognize uh, Mr. Igor Fedorov from Russia, Ma'am. So uh, he yeah. said in the message, greetings from Moscow, okay. Russia. Igor, I'm sorry, I'm going to your country. Yeah. And she, he said, Sorry. according to our constitution, no religion can be established as a state religion or compulsory. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I know I mentioned your religion. I have visited your country five times. And, and I know that the Orthodox religion is very strong. But I'm just comparing it before the... Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's very is strong. It true? Yeah, yeah, you have yeah, a state religion, yeah. yeah? Yeah. yeah. Well, we cannot actually say that it's a state religion because according to our law or federal law, the main law of constitution, there is no chance that uh, any religion can be established as a state religion. That's right. But I hope you understand my example. I did not mean to offend the Russians. I'm just saying it's a trend. It's also a trend in other countries where the president or prime minister is very strong. When yeah, married. and we can say that, uh, well, um, Orthodox religion institutions, they, uh, and uh, our 
uh, executive power and not only let's say executive power yeah. in terms of uh, um, attention that our president pays to that um, question yeah they go yes. along they go yeah. along together yeah that's right because of religion and on the other hand xi jinping is the opposite he does not allow any religion because to him religion is dangerous okay so um these two leaders are the two strongest leaders in the world right now the russian and the chinese and it's because they have the tools of power under them okay so do you have a question igor including humanitarian diplomacy as we are <laughs> talking right now thank you <laughs> i hope you're learning something from the humanitarian law okay yeah yeah sure that's that's such a great opportunity to get into the question do you have a question thank you mr igor yeah. um adelina would you like to ask your question uh, to the ambassador yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. I have been enjoying the the lecture so far, and my question is actually a follow up uh, follow up uh, from what uh, Deepo and Arnel have asked earlier, as well as Grace. Uh, you know that we have been asked to come up with an assessment, and uh, the assessment really focus on uh, the humanitarian needs, and uh, what actually uh, are the humanitarian needs that uh, could be. Uh, addressed by the ASEAN member states through cooperation. But then when we came up with that uh, report, uh, many human, human, human rights group <laughs> approach us really? as human rights group. Really? They did that? Why? What were the needs that you presented? Well, well first of all, the, the report, our assessment report got leaked up, uh, leak, uh, got leaked to the media. Okay. Uh, and it was kind of like uh, wrongly com 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 Context. context yes yeah well yeah. people don't understand that when we came in when we sent our assessment team that was actually based on the direction from the asean leaders and they already yeah. got to uh, yes. and agreed uh, together uh, with the host country to welcome us so that that yeah. was actually uh, quite yes. uh, an okay. but what that came that out sentence. what came out as as, as controversial what can you give an, an example or two controversial was that the, uh, some of the human rights group thought that we should we should have addressed the the human rights uh, uh, the, uh, what is it the human rights issues uh, and uh, they feel that our assessment report is lacking that assessment is silent oh, they, about, they want you to do that they they wanted us to do that they they while actually the scope of our terms of reference and the direction of the ASEAN leaders, this is the highest within the ASEAN yeah. structure, right? Yeah. And the yeah. instruction that to the ASEAN is saying that it should be confined on assessing the areas and the gaps in terms of humanitarian that uh, could be, uh, uh, you know, that uh, as other ASEAN yeah. countries could, uh, could help. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So how would yeah. you explain to the human okay. rights group? Okay. Why, why so, come so yeah, so, so don't don't call it, um, well, for one thing, the human rights group are trying to use their words on you, right? Because they have their own concepts. So do not allow another group to define the words for you. So, so what you can do is not that you are going to intervene in cases of human rights violations. Instead, you mention the certain principles that you are trying to help like for instance you can say we we have to address victims of rape without saying we don't you don't have to say we have to address we have to help victims of human rights violations on 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 sex you get it so in effect you are looking at the medical aspect of it that's why it's nice to have people like dr Dorotan when 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 you say we have to help victims of rape because it might lead not only, for instance, to more deaths, but to unwanted pregnancies, but also it will cause demoralization in the, in the tribal group. You know why rape is being used, isn't it? It weakens the males when their women are violated. So it's actually an assault on the psychology of the male. And that's why, in a way, 
it's a human rights violation against the woman, but the woman is being used as a weapon against the male. So you address the, the violation against the body of the woman, okay? Because it can lead to more diseases, to more deaths, unwanted pregnancies, and then you'll have a country and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so in a way you have to re, remember you have to re, uh, re, there's a name, rename, re, uh, restate. You have to restate the problem for them. Because if you cannot address that, how can you also address violations, for instance, on biological warfare? What if one of us is so intelligent that, that we invent a virus and we release it? Will you prevent the human, will you prevent, I mean, to, to me, um, that can be addressed as a humanitarian issue. And then uh, will somebody say, oh, that's a human rights issue because you are doing this, okay? So, so to me, you better break it down further into specific fields. It's a science thing, it's a medical thing, it's an educational thing, but do not call it a human rights thing because otherwise people start being, you know, edgy about that. I don't know if I made myself clear or did I confuse you all the more? Yeah, I, I think it's that the terminology is uh, ambal lula, no? Uh, and we know that in the diplomacy, um, communications is one of the key functions really that uh, everybody should yeah. learn. Yeah, to, yeah. It, it's actually, uh, some, somebody said that what is most important in diplomacy is the language. You define your terms so that when you make a report, do as much as possible, do not use mainstream language that other groups use that are politically loaded. So if, 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 if a human rights abuse is very loaded anywhere you use it, especially in countries that are very restrictive or in countries that are very security oriented, national security oriented. So, so you, so you don't use that phrase. You have to think of something creative so that you refer to the problem without referring to that issue, which is political. Right. Um, but, um, I'd like to take the privilege of uh, being the moderator here and ask my question. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as we know that uh, also the session would like to elicit some uh, skills you know, uh, or at least teach some skills in terms of humanitarian diplomacy. And we've got into the uh, to the topic of language and communications. Now, in in the setting of ASEAN, we're in we have what more than and I guess languages across yeah. the region. Right? Yeah. So, what if there's going to be a tip that you can provide? You no, know, in terms of how do we actually? Because you said language is the most important one thing that we should be talking the same language, so, sort of. But uh, what if we have more than a thousand languages in the region? How, how do we approach? Uh... You, you, okay. Well, one way of, of course, that's very complicated, right? Especially if not everybody speaks English. But if you want to address it from the point of needs of a person, because if you look at the human rights, how are they classified? Their political rights, economic rights, religious rights, freedom of expression rights, right? freedom of assembly rights. The most sensitive are the political rights, but the ones that are most recognized and widely accepted are the economic rights because everybody has to earn a living, everybody has to live. So if you coach your approach in terms of, we would like to assist your women develop skills so that they can develop their personal dignity and so that they can earn their own income to help the family. You can do the sexual violation there because a, a, a woman who has been sexually violated will not have the strength or the confidence to to, to run after her own economic rights. 
But if you are saying that we need to help all women, we need to help them gain their self-confidence, later on, the violations against their bodies will be covered. It takes a, a little, um, what do you call that, tenderness in the, in the definition because it's a tender issue, okay? But, but if they know that if all their women are kept sacredly safe, I think in some countries, the way they protect their women is they say the woman is a sacred member of the family. I think each one will understand that, especially if you approach it from the point of view of religion. But at least I know in the Catholic religion, the woman is sacred, isn't it? That's why we, we all pray to Blessed Mother, okay, Mary. But um, so the position of the woman in the Christian faith is, is sacred. So we always use the sanctity of the body of the woman to protect her. The others who do not believe in religion, we say, but the integrity of the body, in that sense, it's science. You have to keep the integrity of the body so that you can affect the integrity of the mind. If the body and the mind are integrated and if they are not violated, a human being can function better and you'll have a better nation. You'll have a better, we will have better women who can lead better families. That kind of uh, phraseology so that you don't go into the, the human rights. Mm -hmm. So you, you go generic, human, right. human dignity, yeah. Right. yeah. Ambassador, unfortunately, uh, we're running a little bit out of time uh, and I have several questions. If I may, I'll read the four questions that are now on the chat room. Yeah, and okay. I'll leave to you which one you want to answer whether you want to pick or you want to answer all of them. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. No, it's up to you. I the can stay up there, but you might want to get out of the meeting already. It's up to you. I can <laughs> stay till four if they want to. Okay. Yeah. But, but well, probably, I'll, again, um, I'll, I'll read the four questions that okay. we have okay. and I'll leave it to you how, um, and then we'll probably just uh, do a time check for around the uh, next 10 minutes. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's okay. So the first question is, uh, the one that I've put on hold, but I think somehow it was already answered from Madiati of uh, mm -hmm. uh, Center. That the question about if a country rejects the for the offering of a humanitarian assistance, should this be further negotiated in the name of humanity? That's the first one. The second one is the question coming from the host, uh, that in the case of the Rohingya crisis, those who are fleeing by boats and seek refuge in another country but the country rejects refugees, what international framework can be used? Is it the humanitarian rights law or the international um, human rights law? It and depends. They, yeah, okay. It, it depends yeah. on the country. Okay, can I answer that? The, the, okay. the one. Yeah. Uh, if, if we're talking about Australia, you have to attack it from the point of view of human rights because the Australians are very strong. They preach about human rights. So you attack them where they are weak. But if, if the country that rejected them is a developing country, then you, you attack it, you, you, reply, you, you reply to it from the point of view of humanitarian law because they themselves might need it in the future. You know, you can never tell them, yeah? So, so, so it, it depends, as I said, get to know the interests of the other side. What are their interests? What are their values? What are their core principles? So, so I, I'll tell you, whenever I talk to Americans, I always throw back their human rights thing to them because they're so, they preach about human rights all the time. So one time I was in Vietnam and I was telling them about something. I said, why are you treating some countries differently? I said, I mean, uh, is it because of the labor rights? I said, so does that mean that uh, you will treat one country less favorably than another? So I talk about equality before the law. You know, the American ambassador turned red. He could not reply because every time I attack it from the point of view of equality and fairness and social justice, they, they retreat. But it depends on what country. Now, the first question, Mix, was I, I got a little distracted. The first one, yung... The first question, if the country rejects the aid. 
Yeah, but I said you can attack it on both sides, on either, diba? But the first one before that. that that's that's the question, ma'am, on the first one. Yeah. Okay. The Country second. rejects an offer you guys. Okay. The second, the second one is about if the I think it's linked because if the country that where the refugee is going to rejects the refugee. Mm. Okay. So yeah. I think you yeah. answer, ma'am. It, it okay. doubles in the two questions. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. The third question, ma'am, is from Ramsey Mesameas from Cambodia, who is a graduate of the ACE program. So he's asking if a political mandate is more prioritized like, than humanitarian action, how can we balance this for urgent humanitarian assistance? Okay, when does the humanitarian affairs group get involved? Do you get instructions from the leaders or do you act as an entity on your own? Arnel and Adelina, how do you move in? Because do you have an independent man, 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 mandate? Do you, do you assess the situation on your own? Or do you wait for the leaders and the foreign ministers or the social welfare ministers to evaluate everything before you move? Because if you get instructions from the top, then I think in a way you are being given freedom to move and you are in a way being given the consent of the group. So you, you need not negotiate anymore. Unless of course, you are going to suggest to the leaders that you need to move into a particular country. And if that is the case, then it's not for AHA to negotiate that. As I said, you have nothing to do with political issues, throw it to the proper ministry to do that. That's, uh, I, I hope you, you get what I mean. Do not move in if you do not have the mandate or the instructions for that particular event from your countries of origin. Now, there might be one country who might say, we don't want to get involved. And then you have to ask, should we wait for a consensus or should we just help those who want to be helped? Or should we only send helpers from countries who want to help? That means it's not the ASEAN 10. Because the way I see it, I think in your minds, you are con converging the human rights and the humanitarian rights. The human rights are political. And I know it's hard to get away from them. But if you address them from the point of view of safe spaces and health and dignity of the person and the well-being of the person, the economic development of the nation, I think more or less some, some leaders will save their faces that way. I haven't seen anybody who is so strong and say, who will say, I don't care about women, you know? eventually they do care about the human person as long as you don't mention it as a human rights violation the other question ambassador is actually related to that um before i ask adelina or arnold to comment because the, yeah. the next question is about uh is this again the question of navigating through political minefield when it comes to we advocating don't. humanitarian we, we we don't because humanitarian they're very clear Remember, starvation, that's not a human, you don't have to argue with human rights when there's starvation, because that's a basic right of the person, of course, unless the country wants to starve its, starve its citizens to death. But remember in the United Nations that all people agreed to, the basic rights are based, the rights to health, right? The right to life, the right, access to to you know access to good health access to water those and of course uh, freedom from danger and they may be basic rights but they are not really political rights per se because the people who need this are not political activists because i think you will get involved if political activists are involved because there are times when a when a state acts against a particular village because the political activists are there. But 
but then you segregate the political activists from the civilian population because that's humanitarian law. They are not part of the conflict. You have to assist the innocent civilians from the conflict. Um, in this case, I think you better run to your political leaders and your diplomats. Otherwise, you will really step into landmines. It's the, it's the diplomats who are used to the political landscape who will be able to help you there. So, so Would you consider uh, that ambassador still going low? Yes, you can still go low. But for the humanitarian, you go low. You negotiate at the low level, as I said, at the village and then help. But then the political negotiator should really try to go at the middle level so that you can, you can go at, you, you will be able to go farther. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, if you just have to look at our NGOs, sometimes they don't tell the national leaders. Eh? As far as I know, like, like for instance, the, the same SOS, do they go to the government? Because in, in, in the Philippines, we might be different. We have volunteer groups, they go directly. When you were in Leyte, isn't it they went directly? They did not negotiate with the governor. <laughs> did they negotiate? <laughs> they just went right in. I'm, just, smile. <laughs> I'm the smiling ambassador. <laughs> That's why it turned out to be messy. Everybody just came in, <laughs> according to some, huh? because I don't know I wasn't there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I roll mom to put you on, on the spot, not the other way around. <laughs> Joke. Really? You had to sub you had to seek permission from the governor. No, I mean um because you're asking me, so I'm just smiling. So I'm saying so you had um, to seek permission on the spot, but you cannot put me on the spot. <laughs> no, no, but, but did you have to seek permission? You just say yes or no. Well, we do have, yes. Well, not permission, but information. We have to inform them. Yeah, right. Somehow. But not permission. Because in some also, countries they want permission. In the Philippines, it's just information. You just tell them, I'm entering and bringing this. That's a different thing. Now, in other countries, it depends on, 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 on ASEAN. There are some NGOs that you can use because some NGOs are widely recognized in certain countries, in certain nations. So if you can use them, because they're used to civic action, nobody will misinterpret your action because they are doing civic work. It becomes, you, you become suspicious or they become suspicious of you if they know you are coming from the capital, okay? <laughs> that means you are an instrument of another country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and remember, even right. if we are ASEAN, we are not all on good terms with one another. Let's be frank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Ambassador, it's 3.55 and... Uh, <laughs> one last question, then I go. There's a lot there, there's a lot of things that we can still talk about, but I think we'll reserve it for the full course on humanitarian diplomacy next year. Would you agree? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, so this is just, yeah, just an appetizer. Again. It's just an appetizer. Yes. Yeah, okay. Right. Yes. But so, by the way, um, I just want to tell the group, sorry, Mix. Ideally, you should have a case study. We, Mix and I usually give a case and then you discuss it. And then you will see how you will solve that problem. But we just have two hours and we don't know how to help you discuss a case. It takes two, two to three hours to process a case. It, it, this is where you will apply all the principles that I taught you. Okay? So I hope I'll see you again under a longer course <laughs> so that at yeah. least you, you do not get too, too confused. Okay. Right. All right. Um... Thank you, Ambassador. Um, if I may just, you know, uh, attempt to summarize the discussion for this afternoon. That, uh, so just key points, no? That the Ambassador actually started in broad strokes in terms of a macro, macro lens, no? Of concepts of humanitarian diplomacy in terms of your international human rights law and its difference with the humanitarian law, etc. No? And then she further went into the micro level of discussing the personal level or the different principles or skills that the person, uh, when you talk about humanitarian diplomacy, should have or should 
be thinking about. Uh, as a summary, I I was scribbling here, um, and I'd like to probably um, summarize the whole thing by spelling out diplomacy you know, uh, and keywords, just keywords on on those fronts. You know. So diplomacy, and in terms of D, in terms of the discipline, understanding the discipline of diplomacy and humanitarian and international humanitarian law, etc. But also having the uh, discipline on a personal level. I is for, I think the, the ambassador have been given focus on understanding interests. You know? Interest not of the problem or not interest too about the problem so much, but about the people. So that's your P, you know? D-I-P. L, uh, the, the the, uh, the ambassador also um, quite um, explained well that one of the ways that we could actually make things happen is when you, we go lower, no, we go to the lower levels wherein the people there actually are talking. And related to that is talking to each other is oh, openness, no, sharing your views among each other across different uh, populations. And M, of course, as in any other um, profession, you should have a mastery of the of the things that you are doing. You know? And O, the the value of a, a diplomat to be being uh, approachable. You know? And C, being a communicator. And why I could not think of any other word but why for yay, you know? uh, celebrate the small things that we we can accomplish at that level. Yeah. And, and that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. one more separate, separate the issues from the yeah. human and the humanitarian, human rights and humanitarian. Right. Otherwise, it will become explosive. Yeah. Okay. All right. I guess on that note, uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. And we hope to see you in the succeeding uh, sessions of uh, the Haha Center. Okay. Thank you. Salamat, uh, hapon. okay. Thank you. So wherever you are, have a nice afternoon. At least it's not raining here anymore. It's uh, Thank almost you, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Delina. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I hope to see you uh, And Arnel, uh, see you again. Yeah. Before that, can we ask you to stay? Um, can we ask all participants to turn on their video? Uh, Osa, please. So in the beginning, we had a chance to uh, take a group photo. Um, so if you can turn on your video and we take a group photo. Oh, sorry, are you taking the photo? Can you count? <laughs> Wait. Not all of them turning on the video. Okay, ready? Okay, ready. Everyone look at the camera. I count to three. One, two, three. Another group. Next page. <laughs> There's someone missing. Sultan Rizki is missing. <laughs> okay, page two. Ready? One, two, three. Well, I guess I have it all. Um, thank you very much. I'm so happy. We are learning a lot yeah. from this webinar so far. Thank you, Ambassador and Doc okay. Mix. Um, and, and and I want to thank the Russians for understanding me. Okay. <laughs> I can still visit your country. Okay. Thank you. That would be great. Thank, thank you. you, man. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank really you so much. Door. Yes. Okay. I hope I'll see you in person. Thank you very much. Okay. Salamat, Ambassador. Salamat din sa iyo. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know more about the Haas Center, uh, please do visit our website at www.ahascenter.org and please do follow and visit our social media accounts for the 
let us update and a quick announcement for tomorrow uh, we'll be having a webinar and public launch of our second edition of our publication publication the asset risk monitor and disaster management review are more um, uh, this year we take up a theme on uh, climate emergency so uh, tomorrow there will be um, expert and the author of armor to present their findings um, before we close the session we would appreciate if you can share your feedback comments or input um, on this webinar to help us uh, sh to shape a better event in the future and um, Thank you very much for all your participation. I'm so happy this has been a great um, present for the AHA Center. Thank you.